My name is Alvin. Uh, I'm an engineer on the PyTorch team at Meta. And uh, today I'm going to present a little bit a uh, whirlwind tour of PyTorch extension points. Um, so what does that mean uh, is I'm going to cover a lot of topics in a very short amount of time, and that's going to be terrible. But there are a lot of links in the slides, uh, and they are on the schedule. So do go on the schedule, do uh, open the links, look for all the APIs I'm going to mention, go read the docs, uh, because uh, sorry if you don't understand everything. Um, but yeah, so a quick question basically this whole presentation is about is how many extension points are available in these four lines of code? So I guess most people here are familiar with these lines of code where you load a state dict, you do a forward on a module, you do a backward, and then you do an optimizer step. Uh, there are too many people, I'm not going to ask you for a number, but uh, there are quite a few. Uh, so first of all, some rules, uh, no cheating. So what I'm not going to cover, because I'm already going to go uh, and cover way too many things, so everything in regular Python, I assume you know, and you can find much better resources about that somewhere else. So all this, everything related to subclass, monkey patching, all these nasty things you can do in Python, keep doing them, I'm not going to cover them. I'm not going to cover distributed or torch compiled. These are super interesting, but unfortunately, no time. And if there's anything you're using that I'm not talking about, a lot of them are not recommended, older version of some APIs, so I'm going to try and stick to the latest and greatest. Uh, but there are other things that exist in there. So breaking down the problem from these four lines of code, uh, going top to down into the, the stack trace. So from user code, what I'm going to call core libraries, the dispatcher, where we're going to talk about. If you never heard about it, it's a super cool, one of the best piece of PyTorch, and then your kernels. Uh, first of all, in the user code. Uh, well, I'm not covering that according to my rules above. So the user code is what you build or uh, the trainer you're using from Lightning AI, from Logging Face. All the things, all these tools you're using, they have their own extension points. They have all these cool things you can do with them. Uh, go look at their documentation and everything they do. And uh, that's it. Uh, so now we're going to step into PyTorch, which is the more fun part. So I, have, um, I was thinking how to present these kind of things, and so if people here are familiar with flame graph or things like that, I try to use this kind of visualization to present to you what happens. So from left to right, you have time when you execute. So here you can see the four boxes from left to right at the top is the four lines of code, right? Load state dig, module call, backward, optimize the step. And then when you go down, it's the call stack. So every box at the top, every box below is what is called from that box above. And so if we look at the very top level of these four functions, for example, just within the load state did call, didn't you know there are already three hooks in there? Um, so all the text below here is the exact name of the API you can use to call into these things. So you can just Google these exact names, and that's going to take you to the documentation for how to use this specific hook. So in the case of load state dig, we already have a pre and post hook, so a hook, the two green ones, one that happens before, one that happens after. If you need to do any pre-processing or post-processing on your state dict or your model after you loaded the state dict into it, you can use that. And we have a very cool new one, which is module load on the tensor object, so that if you use subclass or these kind of new uh, extension points, you can have custom behavior when a new weight is loaded. So for example, when you use Torch.io and F4 or Floatake tensors, you can load that into your model as is. And we use these hooks to make this thing naturally work. Uh, module call and backward, pretty much anything can happen. We're going to cover them in a second. And in the optimizer step, we also have step pre and post hooks. So if you want to do processing just before applying your optimizer step or just after, you can register hook into these places as well. So now, diving slightly in the more fun part. So module forward. So at the top, this is just when you call your module uh, on your input. And so here again in green, you have pre-post hook. So every single module in PyTorch, you can have a register forward pre and post hook so that you can do anything you want before and after. 
And we also have global, every single module wide version of these hooks. The two purple ones are about the backward. So if you register backward hooks on your module, this is where the markers are for them to happen during the backward. Uh, in red, the reparameterization, which is a super cool feature, which every time you're going to access a given weight, you can have a custom behavior there and say, I want my weight, for example, to go from this regular matrix to be a square matrix. And it's going to happen every time you access that weight. And then finally, we get to a torch.map or torch.add. So any kind of torch function, we have this underscore torch function hook which is for subclass. So you can subclass the tensor object, and you can use that to interpose at anything that happens at the Python API level for PyTorch. And you can do a lot of super cool things with that. Um, and then you have these Python arc parser objects, which is where we enter C++. And then you reach AT column column. This is a C++ call into the A10 library. And we're going to cover that later, because Pretty much anything can happen once you get there. Um, so that's just the forward. Um, now if you're curious what happens during the backward. So during the backward, we have quite a few things. Here I'm only representing one node. So the backward is doing a lot of nodes that are executed. And just one of them here, we actually have a few things that happen. First of all, within the engine, you can have additions that happen and accumulations, and that's all the way on the left. Again, you call into A10 where anything can happen. We're going to cover that just after. And then even in the autograd node itself, you have tensor hooks that you do when you do a register hook method on your tensor. You have node hooks that are in this uh, node object that you can find available. And save tensor hooks where you can use that to grab uh, and to hook into everything that gets saved from the forward to the backward. And you can do super cool stuff with that. So for example, the new activation checkpointing API in PyTorch is fully implemented using these save tensor hooks by doing custom behavior when things are getting saved and custom behavior when things are getting loaded during the backward phase. The node apply is when you actually do the compute and see two MMs here, post hooks. And then at the very end of the backward, we have autograd engine callbacks. So if you want custom behavior during the backward and you want to clean up at the end of backward and things like that, you have these engine callbacks that are super convenient to make sure that everything is properly closed at the end just before you exit. Um, and so now I talked a lot about these AT column column functions. So entering the dispatcher. So this is the scariest slide I have. But uh, the dispatcher in a few words is provides implementation for every key operator pair. A key corresponds to basically a feature that we have implemented in C++. And every one of these features is going to be enabled or disabled depending on the input tensor for that specific function and some global flags. Um, and here at the bottom, there's a link to a detailed blog post by Aes Yang on the details of the dispatcher. It's 10 page long, so I'm not going to cover that. It exists. If you're curious, you should go and look into it. The one thing that is interesting to know for the next slide is there is two things uh, that are important. A call into the dispatcher is you know when you call a new function from the top of that stack here, and you're going to go down. And a red dispatch is this green arrow where you go from one box to the next box below. Um, and so here are two examples of calls to the dispatcher. So on the complete left, you have AT add, and you see the blue arrow, so this is a call. We start to enter the dispatcher. And if you just add two regular CPU tensors in PyTorch, this is what's going to happen. So you're going to hit the autograd level. At the autograd level, you'll see the save tensor pack that remind you of the unpack we saw during the backward. So this is also here where the custom activation checkpointing behavior is happening. Then we have the view handling for autograd, and then you hit the CPU key because you have a CPU tensor. And that's where you kernel loops, which actually has that for loop over float star numbers. Um, and you can see here that a lot of these is a blue arrow, so you call into the dispatcher and then you redispatch down. Um, on the right side, this is what happens if you have a, what we call a mode. 
So uh, a mode is similar to a subclass, but it happens all the time. So you don't need to have an actual subclass object. It's just always there. And so if you do that exact same add operation with a mode active, you're going to get hodograd. You're going to get the pack hook. You're going to get AD in place of U. But here, just before CPU, you're going to hit the Python key, which is the part that calls into your own handler for the mode. And that is Python code, just like before. So here, literally, anything can happen again. You, you can write any Python code, including calling back into the stack from the top, uh, where we're looking at like a module. And here again, you're going to hit eight and add later on if you decided to still add these two tensors. Uh, now the grid is disabled, so we directly get to the CPU key in the kernel to actually do the compute. So this is a quick example. Uh, I link here the logging uh, mode example if you want to know what that looks like in code. But this is the kind of behavior you can get. And these modes are very powerful because you can easily hook into every single op that's going to happen in your PyTorch execution without having to intrude into the code uh, at all. Um, and so there is a lot more to do with subclass and modes uh, because we have subclass, as I talked earlier, about torch function at the Python level and subclass at the dispatcher level that allow you to do very different things. And we also have modes at both of these levels to be able to hook into everything that happens. Uh, we have detailed docs at this address. You can look into it. And uh, you can come see us at the Tensor subclass with PT2 poster that Ryan is running uh, after this. Uh, because if you have questions about that, how to use this system, what you can be done, uh, we're happy to answer any of your questions. And now finally, we're getting at the very bottom about the kernel. So this specific entry in the dispatcher when you actually run code. And here again, I'm not going to talk about it, but I don't have time. But this is what we call custom ops. So custom ops is all about doing your own entry in that dispatcher system so that you can build, without uh, changing the PyTorch core code, a new system and a new op that is going to do exactly the same behavior as the one we have, but with different logic. Or you can even improve existing ones. And there is a lot of insane things you can do and uh, a lot of extension points you can do there. So uh, I shared here the landing page. It's, again, a very complex topic and a lot of fun things you can do with it. Uh, the next talk in this room, actually, is going to be about uh, extending PyTorch with custom operators uh, by uh, Richard. I don't know where he is. Um, and finally, I wanted to give a shout out to another very interesting extension point we have, which is for backends. So I'm sure here you've listened and heard a lot about different uh, device and new hardware and all these fancy things people built. And you know, within PyTorch, we've been uh, working hard to try and allow all of these backends to run. And it's been a lot of work. And so this, uh, we also have this interesting strategy to do out of tree backends. So we build the in-tree scaffolding once, and we allow people to reuse it everywhere, including systems to do auto-loading so that it really feels just like any other core uh, component. But it lives out of tree, and you can actually build that easily without having you know, the PyTorch core team needing to review every single one of your changes. And intro documentation, uh, this one is not for everyone, but uh, it's very cool feature, so reach out if you're interested. And I would say more generally, uh, I went very quickly, and I'm only slightly over time, but uh, look for the documentation for each of these APIs. And more importantly, just reach out either on Slack or on DevDiscuss if you have questions about any of these things. Uh, they are complex. The goal here was just to tell, let you know they exist so that uh, whenever you want to do something cool, you know uh, where to look for them.